So thank you so much for the invitation to talk to you today. Uh, my name is Daniel Stock. I'm a medical doctor by training, and I have a dual background in uh, systems neuroscience and machine learning statistics. At the moment, I split my time uh, between McGill, Faculty of Medicine, Montreal Neurological Institute on the one hand, <coughs> and also uh, I'm one of 40 uh, Miller professors uh, under the directorship of uh, Joshua Benjo in Montreal. And um, the overarching scheme of uh, research in my group is to try to narrow the gap between uh, state-of-the-art analytics and questions that we have in, in systems and clinical neuroscience uh, with an eye to uh, psychiatry. So yesterday I was thinking about like what talk to give, and I was kind of torn between uh, a series of uh, uh, projects from my own group and an entirely conceptual kind of statistics wars type of talk. So in the end, I decided to kind of package this into a three-part talk where in the beginning, I'll try to emphasize the difference between uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, prediction and inference. Um, then I'll try to provide three, uh, um, 10 arguments, why I think this, those should be uh, uh, separate. And at the end, I'll uh, go back to three examples from my own lab to kind of emphasize uh, uh, these points. So I think some of these slides are going to be uh, somewhat controversial, so I recommend to uh, move the questions to the end just uh, so that I can get through my slides. All right, so um, <clears throat> as you know, uh, neuroscience is changing very fast. Uh, when I finished medical school seven years ago, um, there was hardly uh, the 500 HCP sample out, and I think ever since uh, there has been um, and a kind of an emergence of always larger, wider, deeper, and more longitudinal type of data sets. Um, so uh, the UK Biobank is probably uh, currently the cleanest, largest imaging-based data set that is out there, and we expect to have uh, 100K image subjects in two years. Um, there's larger data sets, such as the Precision Medicine Initiative, and me and other people, we expect that any time uh, there may be uh, an even larger data set from somewhere in Asia. So uh, the situation, the context, the environment in which we do neuroscience has been changing a lot, not for any type of neuroscience. Experiments and hypothesis-driven research is, of course, going to uh, stay important. But uh, in the history of statistics, what has always been the case is that the types of analyses that are invented and deployed, they very much depend on the types of questions and the types of data that exist. And if you think about, <clears throat> I don't know uh, about most of you probably, but What's definitely true for people in imaging neuroscience is that most of the methods, the quantitative tools that we use in everyday life in imaging-based MRI, but also MEG type of research, they actually invented in the first half of the 20th century, um, before Second World War, bef before electronic calculators were invented, and certainly before we had massive uh, uh, data sets. So there was a time when, um, even until the 80s actually, um, when you were dealing with 20 or 30 variables in a same analysis, so running a single model on 20 to 30 variables, that was actually considered something for experts that was highly complicated. Multiple regression only became kind of commonplace over the 80s and 90s. Um, just to give like some examples. Um, uh, after um, Second World War, what I have in the red tone here, there has been an emergence of uh, a new breed of methodologies. Um, it's interesting to consider already at this point is mostly not so much in the statistical departments or other kind of areas of intellectual activity or sectors of society where we would expect maybe new, methodolo new methodologies to come out, but this was <coughs> much more driven by uh, industry, by maybe computer science departments, and uh, uh, less typical uh, uh, um, academic um, venues like AT&T labs, for example. So, and these methodologies, which you may or may not call uh, machine learning, for example, they're distinctly different from many of these other methodologies that are in blue here. So um, over the 20th century, um, these methodologies, they tended to be always more data hungry, always more computationally intensive, always more able to look at uh, more complicated data sets. Um, and they also took always longer to actually understand how they actually work. 
So, and I think in the neurosciences, we're just starting to see always more applications of things like uh, random forests, penalized linear regression is slowly but surely becoming uh, commonplace. And I think the deep learning revolution, which maybe um, became really exponential around roughly 2012, um, it's, it's not quite clear yet to what extent we can really profit from this in the types of data that we have today. So uh, one way to summarize uh, this difference in the general properties of the quantitative methodologies that we have in using biomedicine or neuroscience uh, uh, more specifically is this. Um, that's uh, quotes from uh, one of the most famous living statisticians. And in the 90s he said, the biggest difference between pre and post war statistical practice is the degree of automation. Um, so th that doesn't really necessarily say something about for which type of research, which methods are best. This is what, I, what I'm going to get to uh, in the rest of my talk, I hope. And <clears throat> more than 20 years later, he said, and up to a point where actually in the 21st century, almost all modern statistical applications are computer dependent. So what this means is, <clears throat> to, to put it from a different perspective, um, most of the types of statistics that people learn in psychology, neuroscience, medicine, they're from a time where the, the only way to really deploy quantitative analysis and interpretation was to have textbook formula that are kind of single shot, not iterative. And um, it was a necessity to make a, a set of assumptions. This is part of the reason why there are Gaussianity assumptions everywhere. It's more complicated, there are footnotes. But in principle, things like non-parametric hypothesis testing, even if some of these more modern methodologies existed already uh, at that time, uh, they couldn't really be deployed at large scale. So, and things like machine learning, but it's also true for, for Bayesian data analysis, um, they very much became only possible over the last 10, 20 years to a large extent because um, there were always better software packages that actually allowed an always broader set of people to actually use these types of techniques. So here's a simulation study that we conducted with synthetic data that looks like gene expression. So we generated data and just let's say we're comparing healthy people and people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. We have a bunch of candidate genes and we want to know um, which of those are actually important um, to tell somebody from the healthy group or the schizophrenia group apart. So the thing is now that in A, we use the most common way to come up with p-values using linear regression, whereas in B, we used um, something that's uh, very common in machine learning community, random forests, to revisit the exact same data set to also ask which, which participants um, are actually schizophrenic, which are healthy, and which genes are important. The thing is now that what is considered to be important according to the notion of statistical significance and the notion of predictive validity is not exactly the same. So <coughs> um, in this example, you could al already start wondering, OK, is this maybe because um, there's not enough data? Is this because the noise is handled different? Should this be the same? Should it not be the same? Um, so what's, what's important to consider, and what people like Leo Brayman, who invented Random Forest, actually said, um, there's, no, there's no, probably not a single notion of importance. Okay, So just because we think there may be a small subset of genes, a little more than 100 maybe, that are m most important in schizophrenia, that doesn't mean that uh, these same locations in the genome are also necessarily the most predictive features that I can measure from a person to actually uh, uh, classify a person in front of me, okay? So, and those are first hints that this wish to run a same study and discover biological mechanisms in the brain and about a disease, and to also discover something about the brain that is as predictive as possible, that's maybe, that's maybe not the same research goal. Um, <clears throat> so we got interested in this question, and we ran an even larger empirical simulation study. Um, what you see here is more than 100,000 data sets that we simulated that varied uh, along the dimension that we typically care about in everyday data analysis. Things like, uh, what's the relationship between the number of variables and the number of samples that I have? How many of the variables that I put into my analysis are actually really relevant? Um, how much noise is there? 
uh, how strong is the association with the outcome? Is there actually an association with the outcome? All these things, culinary, things we worry in everyday life, they have been systematically varied in these types of analyses. Um, so there are many things I could say. I'll just summarize that um, what's most important is this yellow area here. And um, each dot, just to emphasize, this is, this is a hexagonal binning plot. So it's something like a histogram that goes towards you and it shows how many of the data sets that were analyzed by standard linear regression and the most common way to come up with p-values and um, a predictive machine learning approach with the most common way to do uh, out-of-sample cross-validation. Um, if I analyze two data sets, is it actually uh, found important according to the classical notion of significance and maybe the more modern notion of predictive validity. So the location in that plot shows to what extent do things actually concur. If they would say the same, we would see a di diagonal. So, and what we see instead is most of the data sets that we came up with, and these are 100,000 synthetic data sets, there was at least one statistically significant variable uh, here that was highly significant actually. Um, but most of the time when we saw that, it did not turn out to be a model that also explained variance in new data points drawn from the same distribution. So if you put it on its head, um, if you uh, observe successful uh, out of sample predictive validity, then um, most of the time you also observed some statistically significant variable, but not the other way around. Okay, so you could say, um, based on these simulations, maybe predictive importance may be the more stringent criterion, and, uh, and maybe there may be more false positives or more false negatives um, in statistical significance testing. So just to kind of emphasize um, the difficulty in this type of project is really um, to approach kind of the standard statistical testing regime and the predictive pattern regime to scenarios where you would really realistically actually apply one or the other at the same time. Because typically um, the scenarios for which a lot of the machine learning methodology has been developed, they're just pretty different from the statistical significance testing scenarios or the types of data sets that, that we commonly looked at uh, in, in biomedicine in, in the 20th century. So going a little bit more into detail, um, you can see that um, there are some cases of recovery, right? Actually, the question is, a variable that is relevant and explains something, carries information about an outcome. Do we actually identify that variable uh, or not? So that would be true positive. The opposite is like true negative. Uh, one of the variables we put in, it doesn't explain variation in the outcome, but we also correctly detect it as not doing that. So in these scenarios, we largely see that um, <coughs> there is actually quite a deviation between the classical statistical way to find relevance in data with linear modeling and the machine learning way to find relevance in linear modeling. So you see that um, this is not a clear diagonal. Oftentimes we may have a small recovery of the truly important variables in classical statistics, but we may actually correctly uh, identify a lot of variables in the machine learning regime. So also if you look at these four cases that we like to consider, there, there are certain scenarios in data situations where there's consistent deviation between how well a machine learning approach and the p-value based type of approach can recover the truly important uh, variables in data. So now, now you may think, well, that's maybe because uh, I set up these analyses in some particular way and uh, there, may, there may be a systematic skewing. Um, so this is why we went back to four real world data sets that have been analyzed again and again in the biomedical literature uh, in various textbooks. So that's data sets like uh, uh, predicting birth weight on a number of variables, um, uh, prostate, uh, uh, cancer prediction, um, diabetes, or lung capacity. So just to summarize the slide, what you see here is uh, again on the x-axis how significant 
is each of the variables that we have in a particular data set on the y-axis, how much variation do they explain out of sample, and long story short, all four scenarios occur in practice in these data sets that we have analyzed again and again. So in a given data set that we have on the table for a concrete project, we can identify significance but not predictive validity, predictive validity but not significance, and all four combinations are completely possible, which you see in this example. So, <clears throat> and now the question is like, okay, should we actually expect, in which scenarios should we expect these to be the same, or is actually the type of research question that we have, is that maybe the more important thing that's constraining which types of methodologies we should use? So, uh, more concretely speaking, in a time where we have deep, wide, longitudinal data sets with so many sources of information. Is this really a scenario where we should still do p-value hypothesis testing, or is this more naturally tuned towards uh, predictive machine learning types of methods? What you see here, <coughs> that's work with John Yanidis from Stanford, is we try to pit against each other the interpretability of families of quantitative analysis techniques and the model capacity on the x-axis. By model capacity, I mean um, the representational capacity. How large is the space of candidate models that a particular modeling technology can actually instantiate? So how large is the space of potential relationships that it can learn from data? Um, and you quickly notice that what's high up on the top left is general linear model, generalized linear model, linear regression types of methodologies, which is what we used most of the time in the 20th century. So they are as interpretable as it can get, probably. There are also scenarios where they are not interpretable. But they also have, by virtue of being a linear additive model, they also have the smallest modeling capacity is actually possible. Okay? So what's important to kind of realize is to compute p-values on every single input variable, it's infinitely easier in an additive model. So the moment you start to add nonlinearities to your data, which the machine learning community is very fond, fond of, and which many of these methodologies have been doing that were developed uh, in the second part of the 20th century, the ones in red, they're actually always more to the right on the scale. So, and the extreme being deep neural network type of approaches. So <clears throat> it's, it's an open question to what extent um, these high capacity nonlinear types of estimators that often work well when we have internet scale data, which we do not have in neuroscience today, um, it is open to question to what extent we can actually deconvolve these complicated nonlinear processing layers to really fully exhaustively understand how every single input variable is impacting an outcome such as schizophrenia prediction. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of attempts. They tend to attack what goes into the model, what comes out of the model, or they do linear approximations of what's happening inside of a, a deep learning algorithm. But I think it's fair to say that up to now, I think there is no exhaustive deep learning explainability type of approach. Um, let's, let's see what's going to happen over the next years. I think there are some exceptions that somewhat escape this trade-off between interpretability and, and prediction complexity. Those are generalized additive models and random forests that I already talked about. Okay, so this brings me to my second part where I'm going to say that um, I think for the ambitions that we have um, about a future of single subject prediction, precision medicine, precision psychiatry, whatever you want to call it, where you look at the particular configuration and life history and biology of a, of a given individual to decide the best treatment for the, for the particular person. Uh, I argue that uh, null hypothesis, no hypothesis testing in most scenarios is naturally much less well suited than the tradition of prediction, which has been uh, at the core of, of much of the uh, machine learning community and also other communities. So um, just an early interesting quote is uh, from this philosopher here from 1971, White, and he said, um, inferences by which I understand null hypothesis testing, but not prediction, explain what has happened. So there's a notion of, me there's a mechanistic flavor. Predictions, but not inferences, forecast what will happen. So if you have not only other data, but data from the future or another time point, um, 
th this is more closely associated to the notion of prediction rather than mechanistic inference of relationships in nature. Um, so just to say this again, um, in, in the 20th century in biomedicine, we come from a tradition where we most of the time try to understand aspects of nature such as like genes that are related to a disease, gene expression that is related to a disease, or brain regions, their volume and their function and how they relate to disease. Um, that is not the focus of the predictive machine learning community. So there is approaches that can tell you to a certain extent that certain variables are potentially more relevant than others. But it's important to see that this, this goal to really um, decipher how we come to a certain decision has never been at the core of this entire modeling community over decades. Um, so this is why um, they can actually embrace all these complex modeling algorithms and they, they can actually uh, ingest internet scale data to make always uh, more accurate predictions, but that comes at the expense of the explainability. Um, <clears throat> another aspect to drive down this first argument to drive it home is um, actually the, the whole theoretical context, like the axioms of where this data analysis um, is actually justified is also not the same. So uh, most people who study in empirical science like psychology, neuroscience, medicine, um, they're familiarized with these types of theoretical uh, uh, concepts, things like uh, mm, multiple comparisons, degrees of freedom is important, and a lot of the justifications of when something works, such as PWS non hypothesis testing, they oftentimes rely on asymptotic consistency. So we act as if we had an infinite sample, uh, and if we have an infinite number of subjects, then we decide something is, is actually converging and consistent to what we wanted to do or not. Um, just to emphasize, not every data analysis culture is based on these things. So. Um, Many of these concepts and frameworks emerged in the first half of the 20th century. Much of the um, more theoretical explanations, when a predictive pattern algorithm can work and does work, it emerged actually much later in the second half of the 20th century. And it's things like wapnik shavonkis dimensions, probably approximately correct learning. And um, in the machine learning community, there's actually much less emphasis on things like degrees of freedom, but more on notions like hypothesis space that relate to the representational capacity of predictive uh, pattern learning algorithms. Justifications, so math proofs that actually legitimize uh, certain algorithmic approaches. Um, oftentimes there, there are finite sample theorems. So um, <clears throat> if you look at the theoretical literature, these machine learning algorithms, uh, more often than not, they actually um, come with justifications that tell you, as you observe always more data points, how accurate are your predictions in new data? And that has not so much been the emphasis in the classical statistics community. Okay, so um, just a, a practical consequence of this is also that notions of um, invalidation of a data analysis workflow. Uh, in imaging neuroscience, at least, we talk a lot about like circuit analysis, double dipping, and so on. And they take a completely different form. So what is the circuit analysis in the, in the classical statistics regime is not necessarily a, an invalidation of the conclusions in the machine learning community, where people talk more about like data snooping and peaking, for example. So um, this distinction has really consequences on so many different levels. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that um, is really now that the data analysis and the, the data sets, they are sh changing so quick that these different data analysis communities are actually clashing and happen in, in the same research lab. And this is why a lot of people are having these questions today and not 10 years ago, like what is actually the relationship of cross validation and p-values, right? All right, so here's another quote. So this is a famous kind of semi-formal textbook on, on statistical inference, classical statistics, and it's really on page 400 or 500 that they say, a type of inference we have not discussed until now is prediction. 
I can't really read that part. Unobserved random variable y, a type of inference that is in the interest of uh, in the regression setting, and then they give an example. So what if what if a school uh, uh, performance is only uh, actually measured later? This would be a real prediction, but that's not actually what we discuss in this particular book. Just to give you an example. Um, prediction has not been the focus of the classic statistics community as we understand it in precision medicine and in precision psychiatry. Okay, second argument. Uh, PBS cannot actually be applied to a single patient. So what do I mean? Um, let's say you have 100 subjects um, <coughs> and you want to find out, okay, uh, what, is, what is the difference between uh, brain morphology in healthy people and in schizophrenics? Um, so I'm not going to remind you how non hypothesis testing works, but you try to reject uh, a, um, a hypothesis of, of no interest, uh, and you want to embrace the alternative hypothesis. And an indicator of how well you can do this is, is the p-value. But you only get one p-value after you looked at all the 100 subjects once. So if a new person comes in, this 101st person, and gives you the same T1 MRI scan, what are you going to do with that p-value? There's nothing you can do with that p-value, okay? Just operationally speaking, there's no way uh, you can use that for a single new person. So now sometimes people say, well, uh, the natural way would be to acquire another 100 subjects and to just repeat the entire procedure. That is a replication. That's not the same as a prediction. Um, and in the machine learning community, as we heard this morning, um, <coughs> there has been a longer tradition of doing not formally justified like this, uh, but empirically validated types of model evaluation, selection, and validation. So uh, as we heard this morning, oftentimes you build a model on a subset of your subjects. You, you then go to independent uh, uh, new data points drawn from the same distribution, which could be another data set or the future, because all we need is IID. And then you evaluate that model, aggregate it across the folds, and you get an an unbiased estimate of the expected performance in subjects that you had, have not observed yet, drawn from the same distribution. But the, the key point is, you cannot ship the p-value to another hospital and expect people to do something with that. That's just not what it, what it was made for. So uh, what I already kind of said is, um, what's true for like other data sets is in particular true about the future. So. Um, since um, <clears throat> you always uh, work in this holdout data set logic um, across sites, across scanners, uh, out, out of subject predictions, all these different types of flavors, um, predictive models are much more naturally suited to be shipped to another lab, hospital, whatever. And if people have comparable data that they get from MRI scanner or genetics, genomics, whatever, they can uh, run the same model on, on other subjects that we acquire only in the future. Um, another very basic argument that surfaces again and again and again is actually uh, hypothesis testing was never intended to work in high numbers of subjects. So the high end setting, right? The, if you have a lot of samples. That has already been said in, in 1938 and even before that. This is just the, the citation I have here in the slide. Um, and this, this showed again, for example, in one of the earliest uh, UK Biobank imaging genetics studies uh, by Carla Miller, Steve Smith, uh, and colleagues in, in Oxford. And they reported that in the 5,000 UK Biobank sample, um, when they looked at peers and correlations between these thousands of brain imaging derived phenotypes with diffusion MI, functional MI, structural MI, and they related it to other behaviors and then the richness of, of phenotypes. And even after correction for multiple comparisons, there was almost nothing that was not statistically significant. So any Pearson correlation of 0.1, 0 0.1, was statistically significant, although you accounted for thousands of phenotypes. So just to say, even at 5,000 subjects, um, is, is unclear how to actually run classic null hypothesis testing in a way where the PV is actually informative and not just a reflection of uh, the, your sample size. So this is, for, for example, also been put in these words. Uh, it is commonplace among statisticians that chi-square tests, or p is more, more broadly speaking, can be viewed as a crude measure of sample size. And this can be framed as a distinction between practical and statistical significance. So uh, many people know and broadly ex expect, if you have thousands of subjects, 
this is a this is a blunt inferential tool. It was not made for that. It worked well in the 20th century when we had uh, dozens and hundreds of subjects, but uh, the data situation has completely changed now. Okay, um, but now what's the other side? The high P setting. So the number of variables of the data sets that you look at. So just as an example, if you run a single model on the entire genome, you, you have roughly a million SNPs. So you are dealing with the P dimension of a million variables that you consider in a same model estimation. Uh, in brain imaging, if you have a high resolution T1, it's roughly the same number of variables. And so in the high P scenario, where we have only thousands of subjects, again, these classical tools, ordinary least squares, all these tools, they were not made for this scenario. Okay, when they when they were or created these tools, nobody had in mind that there, we would have this level, this high dimensional biological data that we have today, and they only have for like 20, 30 years now. So here's just uh, one quote for that. So to give a, a concrete justification, why is this challenging? Is that um, as you have even almost the same number of variables as subjects, ordinary least squares just starts to crack because um, we start to have uh, an underdetermined equation system and um, without regularization, without, without modifications that we do more and more and more, ordinary least squares on which you know, hypothesis testing, t-test and all these things rely, it just actually categorically doesn't work there. And how to tweak and extend linear regression models towards linear aggression in high dimensional scenarios, this is something that the machine learning community just has naturally been trying to do for a long time. That doesn't mean that machine learning is a panacea and solves all these problems, but it's the data analysis community that has been particularly devoted to these high dimensional complex data sets that we see more and more in the neurosciences. Um, this, is, this is even more drastic and clear. So this is one of the most famous uh, machine learning introductory textbooks. And uh, these people from Stanford say, uh, we have seen that when P bigger N, so we have more variables than subjects. Um, it is easy to obtain a useless model that has zero residuals. Therefore, one should never use sums of squares, P values, R2 statistics, or other traditional measures of model fit on the training data as evidence of a good model fit in high dimensional settings. Okay, so they very clearly say most of these tools that we relied on in 20th century biomedicine, they are they, they don't work there without modification in the types of data sets that we have today. So another symptom of the same argument is in standard linear regression, ordinary least squares, if you add a variable, your, your explained variance always gets better. It cannot not get better even if it's noise, okay? Unless you use some out of sample logic. So that's not true. There's footnotes. That's not true if you're in a hierarchical setting, if you're in a Bayesian setting, but we are talking about ordinary least squares. Another aspect is in ANOVA, we oftentimes uh, make the so called uh, omnibus uh, null hypothesis uh, a test. And this means, let's say you have 10 different diagnostic groups which we have more and more in the transdiagnostics data sets that we acquire in ABCD and so on. So let's say there's 10 groups and you have healthy people and then nine diagnosed patient groups. What any classical ANOVA does is it says um, <coughs> whether one group is different from the nine other ones or, or these 10 groups are different from each other in, in, in complicated ways it doesn't matter. It, it comes down to the same rejection of the null hypothesis, which is that all these groups are the same. So and again, in this uh, uh, widely respected book here, people say this null hypothesis, this is most commonly tested in all these ANOVAs that people do. They, they actually say, in many cases, it's silly, uninteresting, and not true. So. Um, the question is, what can you actually do instead? And uh, <clears throat> one possible way to deal with this is uh, what you can group uh, as the family of multi-outcome or multi-task type of approaches. So uh, <clears throat> in, in classical data analysis, logistic regression, linear regression, and so on, we typically, typically have one outcome variable, which is Y here. So, and um, what 
again, some data analysis communities have been embracing for decades, but which has not actually been introduced at a wide scale, in, in, in my neuroscience community at least, is these multitask types of approaches. So it turns out that, let's say if you estimate, uh, here's three, but let's say we have 10 outcomes, we have 10 groups, we are trying to predict the presence of 10 groups at the same time. Um, that means that if we have a linear regression model with 100 variables, we, we actually have 10 times more parameters. That would mean I have 1,000 parameters for the same sample size instead of 100. Um, so and although I have many more parameters to fit, if the tasks are correlated, which many of the psychiatric disorders probably are, then it nevertheless leads to a more robust model fit. Okay? So ways to say this is it's boring of statistical strength, um, there's a shared task. So uh, these, these goals of this model estimation here, they are partially related and partially overlapping. And you can exploit this to use the data more efficiently. Um, another aspect is heterogeneous data. I already alluded to this. Um, we see more and more data sets where we have uh, uh, time series, and genetics, and genomics, and maybe epigenetics in the future, and microbiome, and so on. And the classic statistic methods weren't made for that. So, uh, and in, in some other data analysis communities, such, a, such as machine learning, there's just uh, uh, several decades of literature of how things like multi-view modeling, uh, whatever you want to call it, how this can be done. So things like canonical correlation analysis and, and various extensions of this. Um, <clears throat> another important aspect, we talked a lot about uh, sensors, uh, that <coughs> give us a high density a longitudinal phenotyping. Um, an important aspect is this is not experimental data. Um, also, the UK Biobank has very little experimental data. So, um, one aspect that's definitely changing in the types of data sets we are working with in neuroscience is um, to what extent we actually controlled the setting in which these data were acquired. Typically, including neuroscience, I argue, um, the, the larger the data sets we want to acquire, the more loose the conditions and the less control we have about how these data were actually acquired. So more and more data sets are going to be always more observational. So the question is, should we keep using a data analysis framework that was made for experimental, well-controlled, and, and a priori designed and hypothesis types of studies? Um, maybe not. So, and the last point is uh, phenotype discovery. So, uh, we were talking a lot about intermediate phenotypes, latent factors, latent variables. And of course, there are factor analysis approaches uh, that in, in classical statistics, and that was important for the discovery of the big five. And uh, IQ was revolutionized in that way. But there are other data analysis communities that just have much more sophisticated, much more diverse tools to derive latent phenomena from data in high dimensional spaces from multiple modalities. So why not use those? Okay, so those are 10 arguments why I personally believe that for most of the things we talk about, we, we maybe ask questions these days that are more naturally situated in, in the brute force prediction algorithm type of uh, analysis culture, and much less in the data analysis culture that really tries to max out interpretability, identify true facts about nature, uh, elucidate mechanisms about the things that we are studying. So this is just something else. All right, so and what does this mean for the research in my own lab? So. Uh, I think I still have 10 minutes left, so I'll just try to emphasize what is the consequence for the research in my lab that relates to psychiatric, psychiatric research. So <clears throat> what you see here is a semi-quantitative bibliometric analysis where we looked at PubMed abstracts and uh, we look for the co-occurrence of the word schizophrenia with another term that you can relate to, to pathophysiology. So, and we mapped this out over the last decades because the abstract and the title of all the papers listed in PubMed are free and, and openly accessible, right? You see that, for example, um, <clears throat> around the 50s and 60s, uh, psychoanalysis was a very common term that co-occurred in papers that talk about schizophrenia. And this kind of got reduced over uh, the last decades. Um, 
at the beginning of the 60s, dopamine came in, was very strong, very popular, and it, it stayed uh, very popular. It's still 10% of all the papers that talk about schizophrenia on PubMed. And there are other uh, aspects and candid explanations of what the basis of schizophrenia, what the etiology of schizophrenia, such as in yellow here. So only around 2000s, we really started to seriously consider whether social interactions may be a cause, a driving factor in the onset, or why people actually uh, end up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So uh, when I look at this, I just think this is trends. So there's just a popular theme. People jump on it. Dozens of labs across the planet run in this direction until a, a few years later, some other research candidate explanation is, is popular. And then people investigate something else. So wouldn't it be better if we had a quantitative way to actually derive from data which types of research in a particular domain may be most promising to make progress uh, in, a, in a particular disease like schizophrenia. So if we try to make tiny steps in this particular direction, in the following study, uh, this collaborative work with Danny Bassett, Ted Southwaite at UPenn, um, we try to ask this question that I just mentioned in the context of what are the cognitive domains that are most promising as I can investigate them with fMRI in schizophrenia? So <clears throat> I can't uh, give all the details, but we, um, we essentially looked at the same 500 schizophrenics and control subjects from, uh, from the perspective of several dozen mental concepts and the robust mappings to the brain. And we asked if we only consider these parts of the brain in structure and brain function, how well can I distinguish, so out of sample classify, um, this is somebody who has a diagnosis of schizophrenia or not. So, and then you can actually derive an impartial ranking of mental categories as the brain map ontology at least has used them. And you can find that in the top 10, we have several categories. So construct about mental processes that uh, come out as most predictive that we indeed have been investigating uh, again and again over the last uh, uh, years. So that's things like, as I mentioned, uh, social behavior. But there's also language, which has a lot of uh, specific-ish uh, features about schizophrenia, but there's also aspects that we maybe haven't expected yet so much, such as gustation and pain, which you could regroup as um, categories of cognitive processing that are about processing signals from the own body. And indeed, there's more and more researchers that are now trying to investigate, well, is maybe schizophrenia starting in the communication of the, the body with itself? And then it, it extrapolates to the interaction with the external environment at a later point. So um, the the take home message from this first uh, example from my lab here is, um, at least in the example of MRI, fMRI, that doesn't mean anything about genetics or epigenetics or behavior. If we have these types of data, it is possible to derive a quantitative ranking of how predictively successful can these types of experimental paradigms actually be. So, and let's say this is a valid ranking of these things, then funding agencies should maybe put their money in the things that are more towards the top of the list rather than the bottom of the list. Um, another example is an, an autism and uh, attention deficit disorder. Um, so my collaborators uh, in child psychiatry, they taught me that a lot of the children that are diagnosed with um, autism they oftentimes also have symptoms of uh, ADHD and the other way around. It's somewhere in the space of 10, 30% roughly. Um, so this begs the question, well, is there a common biological basis between people that we diagnose with ADHD or people that we diagnose with autism? Um, so the thing is, if I did, if I did get at that question from a hypothesis testing, a priori designed, group pre-specified type of perspective. Um, I would only be able to derive conclusions that in the end depend on these categorizations of the people 
that I have already imposed at the very beginning of my investigation. So now we'll just uh, summarize here that in this study, the trick was at, at no point in this study, we actually used the labels of who belongs to the healthy group, who belongs to the autism group, who belongs to the ADHD group, okay? So we only fed in all the subjects, independent of their labels, ran it through several uh, uh, structure discovery methods in the MBFA processes, late Dirichlet late location, and we then mapped them to a low rank space where we only use the information of the groups for the coloring of these dots. So and nevertheless, this allows to find a representation of functional coupling relationships, similar to the connectome based modeling approach that we heard about this morning. So we can find a representation and a, and a mapping of all these subjects where there's a continuous transition between healthy people in blue, ADHD and red, and autism in green. So, and, and the point is that these actually, I'm just going to summarize this here, these actually give you better predictive performance than the actual diagnosis labels from medical doctors. Okay, so I, I'm not going to go into detail, it's very hard to explain, but broadly speaking, uh, we're 20% better in distinguishing who is in which of these biologically defined groups in independent subjects, um, than actually classifying the common labels that come from board certified psychiatrists. And the last example is about uh, transgender subjects. Um, we collaborated with experts in, in sex gender research and they had this precious data set where we did not only have uh, um, like detailed information about um, the, the gender phenotype and diversity of each of these subjects, this is the so-called BSRI questionnaire. So this is the, one of the most common tools that people use in clinical practice, as far as I know, to work with uh, uh, gender dysphoria patients. And um, <clears throat> we did not only have subjects that self-identified as men and women, but also subjects that actually made the transition between the two. So we also had trans men and trans women. So this, this is four groups. In this preparatory analysis here, all we did is take connectomic functional MRI type of data, common measurements, nothing special, and we show that in the four class prediction problem, where we pre-assume these categories, we actually perform well above chance, actually twice as good as chance. So that means that this type of brain measurement actually does carry information about these four groups and not only about the usually assumed male versus female categories. But what surprised us actually more, more is that there was no systematic skewing in who was mispredicted as one of the other categories, okay? So it's not true that trans men are a little bit more like men or women, for example. But what we actually wanted to do is to uh, identify continuous axes of brain gender variation. So can we actually co-analyze these 60 items of this established gender questionnaire, BSI, and uh, functional coupling relationships in the entire brain, which we did by canonical correlation analysis. And we here identified uh, that there's at least nine statistically robust directions of variation that are showing strong associations between how major brain networks are talking to each other in the brain and specific pattern of gender stereotypic behavior as they are measured in this established questionnaire here. So the point is, we didn't use the labels for this analysis that we used here. And another aspect is we have more statistic robust dimensions than these four groups or than the male female categories. Okay, so I'm gonna summarize with, with these five megatrends in empirical data analysis in, in biomedicine, but neuroscience in particular, that we came up with Tom Nichols, Steve Smith from the Oxford group. The first one is um, 
the, the new breed of quantitative analyses that we see more and more in the, in, in the more ambitious data sets that we have, they tend to be always more often justified by empirical simulations and validations rather than by making a lot of assumptions or, or formal theory. We, we do not understand why things like deep learning work. Um, um, there is always a larger uh, trend for and um, actually pressure for open science and uh, releasing always larger data sets, collaborating to aggregate always richer information from always more subjects. And uh, this will probably lead to a situation where more and more PhD students will reanalyze data sets that already exist rather than acquiring new data in the lab. Um, three, that's the point I emphasized, I tried to emphasize most throughout this talk. Um, our notions of importance, they, we, we may have to switch them for certain types of questions and certain types of analyses. So the types of p-value based analyses that many of us are in the habit of doing, they may be much harder to actually carry out or even not be carefully aligned with the types of questions that we have, in particular in precision psychiatry. I also mentioned that it is really over the last 10-ish years that the software packages became better and better and better. That's not only true for the machine learning community, but also for Bayesian data analysis. And we think that what was the Bayesian frequentist antagonism in the 20th century, one of these biggest controversies about how conclusions should be derived from quantitative data to draw conclusions about nature. This may actually give way to new antagonisms. And we think one candidate may maybe be that we cannot predict as well as possible and understand as much as possible about the biological phenomenon in the same study or in a same data analysis approach most of the time. So to summarize, uh, different statistic regimes just serve different research goals, and that shouldn't really be a matter of tradition, habit, or taste. So with this, uh, I thank my collaborators for the inspiration. I thank these institutions for their financial support, and I thank you for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.